Good afternoon. My name is Emma Mangles. My name is Mary Rose Rocky. My name is Melissa Pavlov. And we are going to be presenting on our topic, and we have named it Unfinished Business Recommendations for Closing the COVID-19 Opportunity Gap. In just a moment, we will be sharing a video with you, and we'd like you to write down some emotions or memories that this video evokes. China has identified the cause of the mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. There are fears a rapidly spreading virus has reached Australia. This is a rapidly emerging situation. Where there is not a cause for alarm. The first U.S. case has been detected. For millions of American families, plans are changing fast. At least six states, including California and New York, banning large gatherings of people. One of the biggest disruptions, schools from kindergarten to college closing their doors. Parents nationwide now scrambling to care for kids who are suddenly home for the foreseeable future. Experts say school closures were a necessary evil to slow the spread of the coronavirus. But they affected 80% of children worldwide, forcing most to study from home, placing an extra burden on parents. Modern technology helped in many cases, but not all. The pandemic could see millions of children left behind. Can Generation COVID make the grade? Remote learning has been the new normal for Ruzgar, a challenging situation for him and his single mother. Ruzgar struggles to stay focused in front of the screen. He still can't read or write properly. The kids have lost interest in everything. They don't want to leave the house anymore and are losing touch with the outside world. From remote learning to quarantine to teacher shortages, this morning schools and families across the country are continuing to adapt to the peaks and valleys of the pandemic. And now some education researchers warning many kids are falling behind academically. It's what Dr. Karen Lewis calls unfinished learning. Students have lost out on instructional opportunities. They have unfinished learning relative to what we'd expect in a typical year if they got the full dose. Dr. Lewis is a senior research scientist behind studies that show children nationwide are scoring about 9 to 11 percentile points lower in math and 3 to 7 percentile points lower in reading compared to historic averages. <laughs> Now that you just watched that video, we'd like you to think for a little while uh, about some reflection questions that we have for you. So to begin, we'd like you to think back on your personal experience with virtual learning and think about what structures were in place to help support you in your academic achievement. Go ahead and pause the video here and take a few seconds to think and jot down some thoughts. Most of us were in college or higher education when COVID first hit. Now we'd like you to imagine that you were a student in a K-12 classroom and what would those supports need to have looked like in order to help you continue to be academically successful. Now we're going to talk about the opportunity gap. What is it? So when we talk about the opportunity gap, we're talking about the difference between certain students academically uh, and of course, there's always been an opportunity gap. A lot of it has to do with socioeconomic status, as you can see on this graph right here. And the COVID pandemic just exasperated this difference and made that gap much larger. So as you can see here, low income and lower middle income students fit, uh, missed much more instruction than students from higher income or upper middle income, which is going to affect their academic achievement much more. Our guiding question that we're going to focus on throughout our presentation is how can teachers and schools work 
to decrease the size of the opportunity gap caused by COVID-19 school closure. And our hypothesis that will inform each of our three recommendations is that small group learning and individual attention will work best to close this opportunity gap that's been created. Before we go on to our recommendations, we just wanted to note that because the COVID-19 pandemic is so recent, there isn't much existing literature about the opportunity gap specific to COVID-19. So we've used intervention strategies that have worked to close other opportunity gaps, such as the summer learning gap or um, that existing learning gap that we were talking about before that had to do with socioeconomic status. And now let's get into our recommendations. So our first recommendation is to use explicit instruction techniques, including teacher models, guided practice, and academic feedback. There is a meta-analysis by Baker, Gertson, and Lee in 2002 that studied 17 math classrooms. Some of them used explicit instruction techniques and some of them used more discovery-based learning techniques. And they were either experimental or quasi-experimental, so very good quality studies. And they looked at, um, their independent variable was either if the students received explicit instruction or that more traditional discovery-based mix with explicit instruction. So the explicit instruction classrooms had pretty much all explicit instruction, whereas the control had a mix of both. And they looked at standardized math scores to compare between the different classrooms. I would just like you to ask, I would just um, ask you to pause real quick and just look at what you noticed from this results graph right here. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so as you can see on in the red here, the explicit instruction had a significant effect size of 0.65 and 0.58, meaning that explicit instruction increased the scores from the pre-test to the post-test. So um, those students who received explicit instruction only did better than those who received both explicit instruction and discovery-based learning. Limitation of this study is that it's, of course, not specific to COVID-19 learning gaps because it occurred in 2002, which is quite a long time ago. Um, but we, we found that it was still able to increase scores, and that's what we're looking to do here because we know that there's a deficit in scores. So it does still connect, but it's not specific to COVID-19. And the actual number of studies for explicit instruction is quite small, so they only had about five studies within that meta-analysis that related to explicit um, instruction. The others were more broad categories. Um, so here's how you should implement this in your classroom. The first thing is to model and explain your thinking. Uh, many of you have heard of model coach fade in where the teacher explains the problem and their thinking very explicitly and tells you step-by-step -step how to do everything. And then in the coach part, the teacher will coach the students through the problem, a very similar to problem to the first one, and they'll elicit student thinking with questioning. And then in the final step, students will complete a similar problem on their own. And then immediate feedback is given from the teacher to the student based on whether, uh, based on their answer there. So this is a technique that has um, been shown through the research too. Um, model that explicit instruction. So this is one example of explicit instruction. The second thing that we could do, the second part of explicit instruction is guided practice, which includes a lot of things like doing pre-assessments, doing post-assessments, but here we're going to focus on manipulatives. We're going to narrow it down so it's concrete, um, specifically in the math classroom. So the research shows that if you use manipulatives, it will help to increase the math literacy. Here's a couple examples. We have the algebra tiles showing how to um, factor and how to distribute here. So we would have um, x squared and then two x, I'm uh, sorry, x plus two. And it shows how um, literal the x variables are here. We have the place value charts, which are helpful for the younger students. And we have um, fraction tiles as well. So these are a couple of different examples that you could use in your own classroom. 
And then finally, we want to provide academic feedback. So what I mean by that is feedback should be positive and specific to the mistake. Here's an example. Um, if you, let's say a student is misidentifying the number of tens in the number 83. What you could say is 83 has eight tens and three ones. That's positive. You're not focusing on the mistake. You're focusing on the correct answer. How many tens are in 83? Eight. Yes, there are ten. There are eight tens. How many ones are in 83? Three. Yes, there are three ones. So you see the yes is what I mean by positive and specific to the mistake. We're only talking about that one problem that we're looking at. Couple roadblocks. Of course, time in order to pre-assess use manipulatives, provide cumulative review, which was part of that second part with the manipulatives as well. Um, it of course takes a lot of instructional time as well as quality feedback. It's very time consuming. So one solution is to use manipulatives maybe once or twice a week. You could also build cumulative review into your bell work or into your exit ticket, or you could give answer keys either physically or online so that students can self-assess. And now I'll pass it along for our second recommendation. Our second recommendation is to integrate high dosage tutoring practices and opportunities across grade levels. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what that would look like specifically. So one study in 2017 was a meta-analysis studying the effects of interventions, multiple interventions for students specifically with low socioeconomic status. This was a random control trial, uh, again, looking at multiple instructional interventions, including after school programs, summer programs, tutoring, et cetera, and measuring test scores on standardized tests in both reading and math in response to those different interventions. Some of the results are, are shown here. So as you can see, tutoring down here had a weighted average effect size of nearly four tenths, which is higher than each one of the alternative interventions. So we can see that compared to other potential interventions, tutoring has been found to be highly effective for students. Some of the limitations are that the methods did not consider how tutoring impacts students holistically. It was only looking at academic scores on standardized tests. And the requirement for inclusion in this meta-analysis was that 50% or more of the study subjects needed to be classified as low socioeconomic status. So we were only looking at a simple majority. A different study in 2015 was a treatment control study that was intended to measure the effects of eight weeks of one-on-one -on -one tutoring in children with mathematical learning disabilities. And that was measured by having them do pre and post arithmetic tasks and taking MRI brain images. Here, the results show the difference between MLD students or students with mathematical learning disabilities versus typically developing, so typical neurodevelopment development for that particular stage of, of childhood. Um, so pre-tutoring, we see here that there was a significant difference in the percent accuracy that, with which they answered those arithmetic task questions whereas we do not see that significant difference in the post-tutoring test. Looking over here at the brain imaging, the T-score on this gradient from zero to five is kind of classifying the degree of difference between those children in, with mathematical learning disabilities versus their typically developing peers. And the pre-tutoring uh, test up here, as you can see by these orange and yellow highlighted regions, we see regions of the brain where there are some abnormalities in children with mathematical learning disabilities, whereas we do not see that degree of difference in the post-tutoring in the post-tutoring test. So this implies together that children, uh, we actually see their brain wave patterns uh, change and that children with mathematical disabilities when given tutoring interventions can reach the same level of neurocognitive ability as their typically developing peers. Some limitations to this study is that it did not address long-term impacts of tutoring on neuroplasticity and that there is more research needed on more complex and transfer math skills. So here's how we would recommend implementing this in your classroom. Number one, the research shows that this needs to be offered with consistency and that it needs to be structured to supplement regular instruction. So that would look like most likely outside of school tutoring, probably after school, and then it's administered with frequency 
a few times a week for at least a semester. As you can see on these graphs right here, we see the effect size of tutoring increase, generally speaking, with the numbers of hours of tutoring. Second, you want to be sure to monitor group size and outsource tutoring. So with group size, we're looking for no larger than six students, and we'd like to turn to outside of school faculty for tutoring. Uh, the reason for that is that compensation for a paid volunteer is roughly half of a teacher's salary, and there's been no significant difference found in outcomes between teachers, teaching assistants, and paid volunteers when providing tutoring services. Number three, you want to make sure to keep material within the student zones of proximal development. That means that rather than making tutoring prescriptive, we want to make it diagnostic. So we want to administer pre-assessments as well as frequent assessments to set attainable goals so that we know that we're operating within the zone of proximal development and we can be sure that students are ready to tackle the information that we present them with. And finally, we want to foster communication between school and families. So we want to have frequent communication with families in multiple formats. That might be email, that might be written letters home or face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, it's also been found in the research that family events for participating families and tutoring programs gives them an opportunity to meet one another and to know the tutor who's providing the service, as well as home visits. This just helps to bolster different environments of which the child is a part and kind of bridge gaps between school and home. Some potential roadblocks, I mentioned this one earlier, is these are, cost, these are costly to the school. So again, hiring outside tutors can cut down on some of those costs and make sure that schools stay within their budget constraints. It can also be difficult to accommodate family schedules outside of school. So here we could turn to some virtual options, both synchronous and asynchronous tutoring have been found to be helpful and also offering short frequent sessions right after school to minimize any potential schedule conflicts with sports or after school activities. Our third recommendation is to partner with parents to implement low tech literacy interventions. Why is this important? Um, so technology, when we are looking at this opportunity gap, can actually, actually be leveraged as a type of cultural capital or this asset that may promote um, one group as opposed to another. So this could leave students at an increased risk of unequal educational attainment if some groups or families have pieces of technology that others do not. Secondly, partnering with parents really helps to strengthen a student's meso system. So what a meso system is, it's when multiple spheres of the student's life are overlapped. So here we see partners, part, parents partnering with students, partnering with schools. So we see that really strengthening a student's meso system. The study that we're gonna be looking at in a moment here found that 70% to 90% of households own at least one mobile phone, whereas only 15% to 60% have internet access. So this is why we're really focusing on low tech interventions here. So the study, which was conducted in 2020, evaluated two low tech mobile phone solutions that leverage short message services or SMS text messages and direct phone calls to support parents in educating their children, specifically looking at math literacy. So this study looked at 4,500 families with primary school age children, and it was a cross randomized study. So what that means is that phone numbers taken from these families were randomized into one of the following groups, either receiving just the weekly SMS message, a weekly message plus a phone call that we'll talk about in a second here, or the control which received neither of those treatments. And they were focusing on three major learning outcomes, which included the average level or the student's ability to um, do operations such as multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction, place value, and fractions. Taking a closer look at these interventions, so the messages would contain just about a 160 to 300 character message, which was a typically um, pretty simple, straightforward mathematical question. The weekly phone calls involved an outside facilitator who would put both the parent and student on speakerphone. They would confirm that that text message had been received and they are providing direct instruction for about five to 20 minutes um, that corresponds to that math question for the week and really involves going over the thinking and the thought process of the student's answer. Taking a look at the results here, so if we look at the x-axis here, we're looking at all of the treatment groups. I want to note here 
um, this targeted versus not targeted. So some of our treatment groups were targeted, meaning that the students, um, the intervention was actually meeting the student's learning level based off of a pretest that they had taken. Okay, so if we take a look at our y-axis here, this is looking at the learning gains. Once again, we're focusing on average level, place value, and fractions. I wanna highlight two areas of our graph here. Firstly, I wanna look at the intervention of the phone call plus the weekly message. You'll notice here um, in our graph that we have a large standard deviation. So um, meaning that there were large learning gains for this intervention. We'll also note that there was a significance level of 0 0.008 showing that these results were statistically significant. On the other end of our graph, you're looking at that targeted group, meaning once again, the intervention was targeted at this group of students. You'll also note, it, note that there were large learning gains. So in terms of what we should do to implement this, um, I have a few different recommendations. So this combined phone call plus the SMS text message, once again, was the most effective. Usually this is a five to 20 minute phone call. The direct instruction via that phone call should focus on the same type and difficulty of problem. And the study found that um, a dosage of just three hours spread out over eight weeks um, was effective enough to get those learning gains. The messages should include both resources, ideas, and signals. So I have a few examples down here. Um, when we're talking about resources, we're talking about information um, about accessible and affordable educational opportunities outside the classroom. So for example, public libraries provide a lot of reading lists that could be included within those messages. Um, ideas. So this just means ideas for creative and effective practices that those parents can utilize. You can look at that example down here. And lastly, signals. So signals are actually information about those summer learning, um, summer learning loss. And this is really to kind of prompt the parent to think about the importance of this intervention and hopefully get them to continue it, kind of a motivational aspect here. Content should be adapted from standardized assessments. So the numeric problems, if you are looking at increasing math literacy, should be adapted from a standardized test. Um, time limit should be applied. So students had about two minutes um, that was recommended to complete each question. And then that phone-based instruction should include an explanation component. So the student is not only answering that question, they are expanding on their thought process so that that um, facilitator can see where their thinking is. Lastly, instruction should be targeted at the student's learning level. So when we say that, there should be a pre-assessment that is given that's going to obtain baseline literacy levels, whether that's in reading or math, and then that instruction should be targeted at the student's learning level. So once again, if we think back to that graph, there were significant effects for those groups that were targeted, so that's what we would recommend. A few roadblocks in our solutions. First of all, when we're looking at strengthening that meso system, it can be difficult um, to implement something like this because you have to partner with the school administration to send out automated texts as well as outside community. So a few solutions, um, you could utilize the school's automated messaging system or include reminders in weekly emails. You could also leverage resources from school families. So reach out um, to see what community connections you can make. Um, another roadblock that you might face is parental involvement with that intervention. So the study found that of the working phone numbers, 71% were reachable. So in terms of getting the parents involved, a few solutions, um, it's important to frequently update familial contact information so that the right uh, family member is receiving that message. All messages should be sent to adult members of the household just in case someone is not there with that student um, at the time. And then lastly, uh, straightforward language should be utilized, especially for those ESL parents. Um, so once again, you saw in those examples, they were very short, sweet messages that had the straightforward mathematics problem. As we come to the end of our presentation and begin to kickstart our live Q&A session, we have some questions listed here that we'd like for you to consider. First, how can we ensure that our interventions, especially tutoring and parental contact, are accessible to all families? Number two, which intervention do you think is most effective? What makes you say that? And finally, when should you use discovery-based learning techniques instead of explicit instruction, if ever? We hope that that can get us started on our live Q&A session. We thank you so much for watching, and we hope that this was helpful.